How do you mitigate your risk? Montel's forecasting services cover risks from hours ahead to years ahead. We welcome you to hedge your market exposure with our diverse forecasting portfolio. Contact us at sales at montelnews.com for more info and a free trial. Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing energy matters in an informal setting. In today's pod, we return to France, and in particular its ARAN mechanism, which was put in place in 2011 as a way to boost competition in the country's retail sector. The French government is currently looking at ways to replace the mechanism when the current system expires in 2025. We look at the proposals on the table, what they mean for EDF and its rivals, as well as the wider implications for the country's wholesale market. I'm Richard Sverson, and helping me discuss these issues is my colleague Chris Eels, editor France at Montel, and Julien Tede of Opera Energy in Lyon. Uh, a warm welcome to you both. Thanks, Richard. Hello. Thanks, Richard. For those listeners who are unaware of who Opera Energy is and what you do, could you give us a very brief introduction? Yes, I'm CEO of Opera Energy. We are an energy broker, so we help companies find the best electricity and gas deal. And and you're based in Lyon, that's right. We're based in Lyon, uh, we, but uh, we are in every city in France. So we are approximately 100 people, Opera Energy and... Uh, we are six years old. Okay, and you deal with the household and, and the industrial sectors? No, only B2B sectors, on, only companies. Only companies, okay, fine. And um, how would you currently judge the market situation in France, uh, Julien? Well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, com- complicated. It, it's, uh, it's quite complex. I, I said that uh, there are, this month, the, these weeks, a lot of questions, a lot of questions about the the future of the ARN mechanism and of the, the structure of EDF as we know it. These are str- strange times on, on, the, on the French uh, electricity market. Absolutely. And hopefully um, you'll be an enlighten us in what's, what's going on. And, uh, you know, it's good to have these discussions when there's, when there's a lot of debate ongoing in France, not just about the market, but also the future of EDF and the shape of the wholesale market in general. But um, let, let's move on to Aaron then, Julien. You know, for those listeners who are unaware of the mechanism, what is it and, and what is the purpose of it? If you want to understand Aaron, it's a very, very French scheme. So if you want to understand Aaron, you have to go back to, sh- shortly, you, you, you have to go back to the, the history of the electricity market in France. In the 1970s, with the oil crisis, France wished to move to energy independence. So they built 58 nuclear re- reactors. And today, uh, nu- nuclear electricity is about 70% of the electricity pro- production in France. It's, it's huge. And all those nu- nuclear plants, they were financed by French consumers at the time when EDF was still a, um, a monopoly. So today, the, the cost of this uh, historical nuclear production, it has been amortized for many years, so it's relatively low. And by the beginning of the year to 2000s, the electricity supply market in France uh, has been open to competition. So EDF is still the only nu- nuclear pro- producer. But EDF is in competition with alternative suppliers uh, on on the supply markets. So in 2010, the ARN mechanism was was put in place. So uh, ARN stands for Regulated Access to Historical Nuclear Electricity. So the aim of this mechanism is to share the historical nuclear rents with all the consumers and not only EDF customers. So every year... EDF has to sell up to a quarter of its nuclear production to its competitors. And it has to sell that that, uh, nuclear production at a price that is supposed to reflect the historical production cost. So this price is uh, 42 euro per megawatt hour. Perhaps we could zoom in on, on that price later. And each year, Every competitor of EDF has to order volume electricity, RN electricity, from EDF. 
So every supplier can order uh, RN depending on the, on the size of their customer portfolio. And at the end of the year, RTE, which is a French uh, T TSO, checks that every supplier hasn't requested too much RN re regarding its actual rights. So if a supplier orders too much RN, he will have to reimburse the excess. He, he, can, he can even uh, pay a penalty if he order really too much RN. There is a limit. There is a ceiling. Of, uh, we, we call it a ceiling of 100 terawatts of RN per year. The problem now is at the end of 2020, 81 supplier re requested more than 146 terawatts of RN. So it's, uh, it's more than 100. So uh, every supplier only received about 78% of what they asked for. So this is called capping. And uh, it's uh, one, one, one of the, of the problems of the RN mechanism. And as you said in the, in the introduction, uh, RN is supposed to be a transitional agreement until 2025. Thank you very much, Julian. That was a, a very good summary with a historical perspective. So I can imagine with current wholesale prices and the wholesale prices that we've seen over the, the last few years, this is uh, you know, a very attractive uh, offer for, me, for many suppliers and companies such as, uh, such as yours. But why is EDF opposed to it? It's a very good question, but maybe I, I can talk about the price, uh, the, the price of 42, which, which is low. <laughs> When Aaron was, was, was set up, on one hand, the, the court of auditors, la, la Cour des Comptes in France, asked for a price of 49.5. And on the other hand, some alternative supplier asked for a price of 35. It's quite a gap. And uh, at the end of the day, I, I like the, the story of Jean-François Jean Carinco, who is the, the president of the Energy Regulation Commission in France. She said, why 42? Because not 43. <laughs> at a given moment... Um, you have a decision with with a lot of technique, but a guy says it's like that. So why why forty two? Because well, it's a, a political choice. So indeed, um, one of the of the success of Aren is that it opened up the market to to competition. So for that, it's it's really a good thing. As you said, EDF is strongly opposed to to Aren. In twenty nineteen, in a hearing before the the Senate's Economic Affairs Committee, EDF CEO, Jean-Bernard Jean Lévy, he, he described RN as a real danger and as EDF's main handicap. So uh, the EDF really uh, is, is opposed to, to RN. And uh, it's a real problem for them because it is an option to its disadvantage. Let me explain that. If the market price is uh, exceed RN price, then... Everybody wants RN, and then EDF uh, will, will sell its production at RN price. But if the market price is below the RN price, and it, it was the case between 2015 and 2017, then nobody orders RN, and EDF has to sell its production in the market <laughs> at low price. So mm. they, they have the, the choice between uh, lo losing and losing. And I think that above all, the, the price of 42 it does not allow EDF to, to consider financing new, new re reactors. And the, this is, I think, the main problem for, for the Hercules project that is uh, in discussion be between, uh, between Paris and Brussels. We'll come back to that. But I, I think, you know, that some would say maybe there are, there are other handicaps which uh, EDF maybe has to deal with. But, uh, yeah. but Chris, I'd like to bring you in here because, uh, you know, or maybe you'd like to ask Julien some questions. But I think just before before you do, isn't isn't this a very peculiar French way of dealing with this competition element? I mean, some countries would maybe think about breaking up the production or or, or looking at other ways to, to solve it. This this Aaron seems to be a very complicated way of, of dealing with with this element of competition. What would you say to that, Chris? You've been covering this market for several decades. Yes, but it, it is an unusual method, I suppose. But we're dealing with a market which has been dominated by EDF, uh, the former monopoly, which owns uh, the vast majority of production assets in France. So these discussions, uh, other options were all discussed before the Aaron was, was put in place way back in 2011, I think it was. Um, there was a committee, uh, it was called the Chom uh, Commission, the Chomsur Commission, if I'm right, uh, Julian, I think, 
And, and these uh, different options were considered, including, uh, I think, uh, trying to introduce uh, competition in a different way, which would have meant actually allowing uh, competitors to own production assets in France, maybe uh, to own uh, nuclear power plants. But that, in a situation uh, with uh, EDF in, in complete control almost, almost com- total control of the production market, it's, it's very, very difficult to do that. And uh, to imagine anyone, any private company building nuclear power plants uh, anywhere in Europe now, it's difficult to imagine, even though, of course, there are governments at least preparing to do that. So this was felt to be the, uh, the, the solution. But yes, it's very French. and uh, It upholds the dominance of the incumbent in a sense. It does reinforce the dominance of EDF in a way, yes, um, because it doesn't really allow true competition into the market. That was one of the criticisms of the original Aaron plan, in fact. Excellent. So if we're now looking at this, there's discussions now, aren't there, Chris, between the French government and, and the European Commission, isn't there, about this mechanism? Yeah. That's right, yeah. We'll hopefully come on later to the involvement of uh, EDF in terms of EDF structure because any changes to ARIN, um, which are under discussion at the moment between the government and the EC, are tied to a uh, restructure of EDF. In fact, EDF has proposed the restructure of EDF in order to improve uh, this reg- nuclear regulation. Imp- by improve, I mean to get a better price, to get a higher price. So. Now, the latest we hear is that uh, the government and the EC are reportedly mulling, increasing this fixed rate of 42 euros. At one point, there was talk about a price corridor being introduced, so you would have a range between 42 and 48, something like that, uh, floor and ceiling. But now it seems, or at least it's reported, that there could be these discussions around actually increasing this fixed rate. So I suppose we don't know yet. The discussions are ongoing. Nothing has been announced or decided, as we understand. But Julian, if I could ask you, if they were to increase the fixed rate, who would therefore be the winners and losers? Would that be a suitable solution, do you think? What would be the outcome if that was to happen? What are the implications of something like that? Indeed, everybody is, is expecting a price increase. Uh, the Energy Re- Regulation Commission recommends a price of 48. EDF estimates the fair price will be 53. But I think we we hear the, a price of 48, which, which would be the, the future price. Price is one issue, but it, it would go hand in hand with, with an, an increase of the, of the RN volume. Uh, we, we've talked about the, the ceiling of, of one, 100 terawatt ter- ter- hour. Sorry, which represents a quarter of uh, the EDF annual nuclear output. Yeah, yes. So may, maybe it could go up to 150 or even a more, more profound uh, overhaul of the, of the, of the mechanism. So I don't think if we can talk about winners and losers, but I hope in any case that the the winners will be the consumers. And I think a price increase, it's not shocking. It's not shocking, especially if it makes it possible to to build new reactors. But it's really necessary for the the increase to be planned several years in advance because consumers needs visibility and uh, the, the lack of visibility is one of the problem of the of the RN scheme actually so you would be your company for example would be happy with a price of, of 48 Opera Energy, we, we don't buy iron we, we, we just uh, help companies uh, and understand uh, all those uh, issues and what what we see when when we were talking with the electricity consumers, is that first of all it's very complex and bu- bureaucratic as, as, as you said it's it's very French but they lack vi- visibility so you can handle a, a price increase but you have to plan it and if you go from 42 to 48 it would be such a price increase almost 20 percent so I don't know if you can uh, have such a, a huge pr- price increase, in 12 months, maybe you have to plan it uh, several years in, in advance. In fact, the small suppliers, the people, the, the companies buying this uh, nuclear output, they, they will be clearly the losers with a price increase such as that. So you, you would expect something closer to 45, perhaps? Or... I'm not sure the, the alternative suppliers would, would be the losers, if, if that's what you mean. 
Yeah, because uh, how do they stand to gain with a price increase? The customers or the alternative suppliers? The alternative suppliers, yeah. Yeah, the Aaron price is a price reference, so I don't think it would change anything to to the competition. J- just the price re- reference would would go from forty two to to forty eight. I, I think so. You, it would not have any marked effect on competition. I, I but what what are the main concerns here from the European Commission, and and uh, how do you expect the negotiations are still ongoing? I expect. What do you think the outcome would be here? You have news every day. I've just read a, a Montel papers one hour ago, uh, st- stating that. Uh, the discussion was very, very com- complicated, <laughs> and uh, s- sadly, I've, I've just broken my crystal ball, so <laughs> I, I can't, I can't tell the, the future. I like um, a sentence from a French com- comedian who once said, "Forecasting is a complicated art, especially when when it comes to to the future." <laughs> So mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I, I don't know, but there, there are there are ob- obviously two two sin- scenarios. I, either the the current discussions are concluded quickly. And you, you can imagine the setting up of the Hercules project. And by quickly, I mean weeks or months. And if it's not concluded quickly, I think we would go uh, towards a, a, a status quo until the next uh, pre- presidential election in, 20, in 2022. And I think the latter scenario, I think it's the most likely at, at present because the discussion are really hard be, between the, the, the government and the EC. And there is in France a strong opposition, uh, especially from the unions. And um, you can't hear any voice in favor of the, this project. So it will be it will be difficult. So this is the Hercules project, as it's so called, which is, you know, for those listeners who are unaware, it's the it's the plan to split up EDF into a a more green version yeah. and then also keep the sort of bad bank of the, the nuclear part. Would that be a correct way of interpreting it, uh, Julien? Exactly. It would split EDF in in three parts, well, in two or three parts. On one side, a public company, uh, including the nuclear, and on the other side, a private company, including re- renewable and commerce. So the iron, any, you know, the discussions and the reforms are very, very complicated, but is it given an added layer of complexity given you know given that it's tied to these plans to restructure uh, edf so does that just add a extra extra layers of complexities given the opposition etc so um so maybe no no deal until 2022 2023 yeah I sorry, think... Julian, I was just, sorry to interrupt yeah. do you think that, that that's very interesting that you say that that you you think that that is the likely scenario now that actually we won't see a deal this year before before the french elections in fact that that's what that would mean is that is that a widespread belief now do you think in the market yes i think yeah and what does that mean then what impact does that have because the part of the reason that edf is demanding an increase in the price is because they need the money to uh to 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 maintain uh, their nuclear fleet and and to build new ones uh, that would you know if, if that was ever to happen so that, that would have implications wouldn't it a delay the problem is that this reform is very unpopular, and the the only voices you you hear in in its favor it's the the governments and the the management of EDF. And you're right. It, it, for for me, it's a, it's a pity because this reform, for me, it's the necessary condition if you want to construct new uh, nuclear reactors. So if you think that nuclear power is useful for the energy transition, and I have to admit it's my case then you have to be disappointed by the delay of, of this project. So what's the main, I mean, the main opposition to, to the project? Is it because just changing the nature of EDF, maybe job losses, fears for the future in that sense? Would that be a way of looking at it, uh, Julian? Yeah, I, I think the main reason against that project is, is that um, it is seen as a dismantling of EDF. It is seen even as the end of EDF as, as we know it. And I don't think it's the case, but it's what the, the unions say and it's what you, you can hear on the French media. Absolutely. And what's, what you can read on Montel as well. I mean, I think uh, it has, you know, obviously when the unions react so strongly and, and, and cut production at nuclear uh, plants across France, that obviously has a has a very big uh, impact on prices and on the market in general. 
Chris, is there anything you would like to round up here and ask Julien? Well, it's it's really back to these the implications of, of of all this, I suppose. You know, do you think you can say, uh, as you said, a delay likely um, before perhaps nothing before French elections? What will will happen? I mean, perhaps we won't have a will there be a different kind of regulation? We could have a whole new plan, I suppose, um, depending on the next the next government. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that um, if you don't do something in the following weeks or month, then you will fall in the in the pre- presidential campaign, and then EDF and uh, and, and and nuclear plants won't, won't be a, a, a problem. So it, it will be delayed until. Uh, 2023 uh, or even 2024 so no one can can say what will be decided uh, in in the future as we often say on this podcast Juliet the only thing that's certain is is it's going to be very uncertain um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's certainly the case with something as as complex as this and uh, it's also it's not just economic it's political it's it's the future of the energy transition so you know it's something that we'll be watching very very closely so Thanks very much, uh, Julian, for, for joining the Monto Weekly podcast this week. Uh, and Chris, also to you, thanks ever so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Th- thank you. So listeners, that's about all from the Monto Weekly podcast this week. You can follow the podcast on our own Twitter account where you can direct message any suggestions or questions or let us know if you have a, an idea for a guest on the show. You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in the energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and goodbye.